you know, right. it's, it's a party season. <laughs> mm. The Ladakhi people who are culturally related to Tibetan people, uh, but they're different people. They live in what's now uh, politically northern India. Ladakhi people, in many ways, uh, you could say Tibetanized uh, peoples, uh, they celebrate their New Year uh, in December. So mm -hmm. there's the Ladakhi Losa. So now, right now, as Tibetans celebrate Losa, so this year, Tibetan New Year and East Asian New Year coincides on the same day. Sometimes it's one month apart, sometimes it's one day apart. <laughs> this year it coincides. But Ladakhi people right now, they are actually engaged in um, intensive uh, spiritual practice. Uh, because the first 15 days of the, uh, the new year uh, for Tibetans uh, also commemorates the 15 days in which Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, the historical Buddha, is said to have displayed the great miracles for 15 days. And these great miracles are, you know, super normal uh, feats. And they said that the most uh, uh, impressive one is on the 15th day that he levitated up into the sky uh, and from the top part of his body, uh, fire uh, issued forth and the lower part of his body, uh, water uh, came out. Sometimes it's called the double miracle. Um, but the, you know, beyond the details of each day, what kind of miraculous display, the notion there is that for these 15 days, he was uh, correcting the wrong views uh, that were prevalent in his time meaning mistaken ideas about where suffering comes from, where happiness comes from, what is the cause of happiness, what is the cause of suffering, in all its sophisticated forms develop into ideologies, develop into philosophies, developed into religion, spirituality, all of that, the Buddha is said to have spent those 15 days, these 15 days, uh, which started with yesterday, to overcome all these mistaken views through reasoning through debate through logic through the you know walking people through all these mistaken views but they said that uh, there were also some who were still unconvinced eh? even though logically you know using reasoning the buddha showed everything but they still mm, insisted on like believings eh? uh, these mistaken views at which point the buddha then displayed these miracles so I think what it's saying to us is that, you know, again, we have two levels of uh, beliefs. We have the level of belief about things that can be clarified through reasoning, through logic. And so we apply that level, of course, and the Buddha encouraged us to, for example, uh, scrutinize, analyze his teachings. Uh, don't accept his teachings just based on uh, hearsay, based on faith, based on fear, uh, based on expectations, but to really uh, work with those teachings and, uh, um, you know, accept them based on uh, sound reasoning. So the Buddha taught that, advised that. But there is another level, I think, it's, so this display of miracles is speaking to uh, a more, I guess you could say, a deeper level, a more ancient level, which cannot be reasoned with. <laughs> Reasoning stops, you know. So uh, how many of us have found ourselves under mm -hmm. the grips of suffering, you know, and simply cannot let it go? We even know all the teachings about how where suffering comes from, how we create our suffering, how we make those choices, la la la, all of that. But in the midst of under, when we're under the power of suffering, you know, we will even say, you know, I know that, but I 
I cannot, I cannot, I cannot drop this suffering, right? So this is that ancient layer where then, uh, so that ancient layer of like uh, stubbornness, uh, of not willing to let go of suffering, despite knowing better, right? We say, I, I know better, but I can't, right? So that is really absurd, you know? And therefore, Buddha has to also do absurd things like flying up into the air, fire shooting out of the top of the body, water coming from the lower part of his body, right? Which you say, what's the point of that? Oh, you know, like <laughs> modern people, don't you say, well, that's kind of, you know, cheap parlor tricks, you know? <laughs> but, you know, but, I think to me, it's that story is pointing to, uh, we get, when we are really suffering, you know, uh, that's when even despite what we know about the Dharma, forget about Dharma, even like ordinary things, you know, we know hmm, why this is happening, but we still cannot accept, we still insist, you know, I have a right to suffer. <laughs> this is my right, you know. And this is the absurdity, and therefore Buddhists have to display miracles. <laughs> so these 15 days, it said that whatever we do that is virtuous, when we do them and we remember the significance of these 15 days, then the good that we create during these 15 days, the effects are multiplied. So this is called the million multiplier month. <laughs> it's like your, uh, you know, Delta Airlines or, you know, <laughs> American Airlines, you, know, you could multiply your miles, you know, if you flew on this month or that month. Uh, or if you pay some extra money you know they could multiply your mouse by three times and so they stole this you know from the buddhist uh, we have uh, merit multiplying months uh, this month is one of them uh, and then during the buddha's enlightenment the vesat month uh, called sakadawa is another one of those months uh, and i never quite really understood you know how 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 like at least the logical part you know how this works you know like how is it that you know the merit can multiply but i think i finally got some insight into that which is it is not merely that when you do something virtuous during these fifth especially 15 days but it extends to the month but the first 15 days not merely that you do something good you do something virtuous but when you do something good and virtuous and you recognize that and then you say and I am doing this because right now is the season of remembering what Buddha Shakyamuni did. It's when you kind of tap into that, then there is great power there. Then the merit, so to say, is multiplied by a million times. And and that multiplied by a million times can be dedicated to all, all beings. Yes. So this is uh, 15 days of engaging in uh, virtuous, uh, good things. Uh, so be kind to each other, be kind to people around you, be generous to them, uh, be patient with them, generosity of uh, mind and time and resources. Be extra vigilant with disciplined conduct, and then uh, pay more attention to your mind stabilizing in bodhicitta, the meditative concentration of bodhicitta. So if we do this, you know, during these 15 days, then it's very beneficial. Good. <laughs> yeah. Care and wisdom works. Good. I'm glad you like it. It's American size mug. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Although it's Peruvian in origins, but uh, it's a supersized tea. <laughs> Um, I don't know if Karen told any one of you um, in this last trip that we were in Peru with His Holiness, uh, uh, Karen, Daniel from Little Rock were there. And uh, I, I had gone to uh, uh, and Joyce, yes, uh, sushi restaurant. Uh, yeah, Karen, Joyce, Daniel. Anybody else from Little Rock? That was going to be a fourth person, but uh, it didn't work out, actually. Uh, anyway. Mm. So I had gone to a sushi restaurant in uh, uh, Cusco. Uh, oh, they had the best, like, uh, vegan sushi as well, uh, which is like a, a roasted tomato with the skin taken off, but marinated in, you know, this soy, soy based sauce. And uh, it uh, it was like it was like sashimi. Uh, wow. It's amazing. Um, anyway, <clears throat> I mean, so that I I don't accidentally engage in deception. I'm not vegan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I grow up, I hope to be. But uh, meanwhile, uh, anyway, I saw uh, there was this this uh, tea mug. Uh, mug. That I really liked, and they're like, "Oh yeah, there's a, a famous uh, pottery guy down in Sacred Valley," and so they gave us the name. So what, when we were down in Sacred Valley, then I made a point to well force the group to go to the pottery <laughs> place, and so the master himself was there. So he spent a few minutes with us talking about his work, showing us his more kind of abstract, you know, modern art stuff, and his his pieces are like at the World Bank, like the UN in New York and all of that. Uh, then his wife, and usually, right, the one with the common sense, <laughs> she, runs, <laughs> she runs a business of these, you know, these like, uh, you know, mugs and cups and plates that, you know, real people would actually be able to afford and you know, so she's the one paying the bills. He's the one living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as we were in there buying this pottery, talking, 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 it turns out one of our sons live in Little Rock of all places. <laughs> no. And uh, they have a little, Karen, they have a little place in Little Rock. They have, a house, they have a house in Hillcrest. And in their garage, they have his stuff. Uh, okay. And okay. so they are so, so sweet. So I went over there and bought some stuff for Dr. Lai because he's he's got a collection going on. <laughs> and so I took that when I went to Asheville. So anyway. Yeah, so um, uh, we had a, 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 a group of you guys out here. It was really wonderful. Uh, Joy, Sarah, Zach, and Karen. Uh, did I get everyone this time? <laughs> four or four, I, yeah, that's four. Yeah, yeah. Four people came uh, recently for His Holiness's programs at Urban Dharma. Everything went really well. It has been a whirlwind because I was gone since uh, Peru um, in the middle of the <coughs> I had been gone the whole time. And then I got back here a week before His Holiness arrived. And then uh, and many other people arrived. And thank goodness to the other people who arrived. Because here's the thing, right? I think you all understand. Uh, when you like <clears throat> go attend a Dharma event somewhere else, uh, basically you have all the time and the leisure to be helpful to, to do things, you know? But when you're hosting a Dharma event in your own hometown, no matter how much you tell family or work or your pets, you know, I'm going to be busy that weekend, you you cannot get away from needing to take care of them as well or do things for them. Uh, so 
this time would not be possible in Nashville if we then didn't have uh, like the Little Rock group, the Mexico group, the Guatemala group, uh, and people coming from different places uh, that we, we got uh, everything done and done nicely, graciously. Uh, and uh, it was, um, and I was very proud to tell people that uh, uh, despite this big event, um, for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we never had a real meeting. <laughs> there was no committees, there was no meeting, there was no leader of this, you know, group or that group or, you know, there was no subcommittees, nada, nothing at all. Mm. There were things that needed to be done and uh, everybody stepped up and did things and then ta-da! <laughs> so that's the plan and the goal moving forward, right? Never to have any meetings and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hope to get everything done. I was like, that's the definition of like in the Tibetan tradition, we always talk about, you know, spontaneously arising and spontaneously blah, 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 spontaneously blah, blah, blah. Uh, spontaneously doesn't mean, you know, like you don't do anything. Uh, spontaneously means that uh, somehow the chemistry of things uh, are, are so in sync, you know, then everything gets done uh, seemingly effortlessly. Even when there's a lot of effort, but it's not like force or contrived effort, you know, so things just coming together is... is it's really what we're talking about when we say spontaneously accomplish, spontaneously establish, spontaneously arising. And so that, so this weekend is really, this past weekend is really an example, last weekend now, <laughs> it's really an example of like how things came together. Mm. So His Holiness blessed the land on Friday. And then uh, just this Tuesday, uh, the outer shell of the building was delivered. Now we're waiting for the weather to get warmer and drier and finish uh, grading that site. And then once it dries out and warms up, uh, the slate foundation will be uh, poured. And once that is ready, then the people will come and build the building, which they say it takes only two days. It's a simple barn style building, you know, metal roof, metal siding, with a portico in front, you know, and some stone facade. Uh, it's a 40 by 40 uh, Dharma Hall 1.0. So we hope that by summer, mid late summer, we will finish up all the other things uh, and be able to host our very first program in mid to late summer. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that went really very nicely uh, on Friday. And then on Saturday, uh, originally it was the Bodhisattva Vow program which His Holiness did. Uh, but even the Bodhisattva Vow program, the His Holiness did a uh, the kind of longer version than the usual Bodhisattva Vow, which is distinct to the Dugungagyu tradition, which involves uh, the absolute bodhicitta uh, transmission, not just the relative bodhicitta, which is what most other traditions mean when they say Bodhisattva Vow is the relative bodhicitta. So the absolute bodhicitta he gave uh, in the context of an empowerment that he added uh, to our program. Mm -hmm. We were very fortunate for that empowerment that he added to the program historically has been very restricted, um, often only given in His Holiness's private quarters. Mm -hmm to small groups of like important 
teachers to kind of carry it to the next generation. Uh, but things have changed in the sense that uh, the irony of that is that so there is a cycle of practices, starting with the preliminary, starting with the nguondro. And just like the triple excellence, you know, it has the outer practices, the inner practices, the secret practices, and the reality practices, then followed by uh, truko, physical uh, six yoga style practices, uh, then the solution completion stage, Mahamudra meditations, uh, then a number of supporting practices related to health, related to overcoming negativities. Uh, so as a complete cycle of teachings called accomplishing the Guru, the profound path of accomplishing the Guru, but it was so secret uh, in terms of so restricted its transmission that in current times, even His Holiness is not sure which monastery or nunnery is focusing on this set of practices. The one monastery that historically is like the holders of this tradition in, in recent years have kind of turned their attention to something else to a Yamantaka cycle of practices so that this accomplishing the Guru has kind of declined. Um, so His Holiness um, basically at the end of that empowerment announced to everyone uh, that he has given me the responsibility of holding this cycle and ensuring that this cycle continues. So I have new assignment, uh, mm -hmm. and it's good with the uh, forest monastery uh, being built. I think uh, time to stay put and uh, really uh, focus on this cycle and to keep this going, to hold this uh, this this special uh, practice. Mm -hmm. So that was very uh, special uh, and uh, very inspiring for myself. Uh, in the cycle, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni is a major uh, mm -hmm. focus, actually. So it's also very unique to Dugong. Uh, we, we actually have a lot of emphasis on focusing on Buddha Shakyamuni. Which I've always felt, you know, like growing up, I grew up in the Buddhist context. I felt that Shakyamuni, especially among Mahayana and Vajrayana people, seem to have, you know, gotten like shorted, you know. <laughs> Everyone is so focused on like other Buddhas, you know, medicine Buddha, Amitabha, and this Buddha, that Buddha, and like, you know, like, wait, what happened to Shakyamuni, you know? <laughs> But in this cycle of practice, um, Buddha Shakyamuni is a prominent figure and, and uh, very interesting, unique uh, visualizations involving Buddha Shakyamuni. So something close to my heart suddenly, you know, given the charge to, to hold it. Uh, so I have been also busy, even though for all the things that are going on, it was kind of, I think this is what they call blessings, you know, like being inspired and being energized. So even though, you know, leading up to his holiness coming and already, of course, before he came in Mexico, he already said, I will give this empowerment at your center. And it was because I requested him to give this empowerment and this cycle of practice one week in India, I said, please do it in the main monastery so that people can come and, and you, you put some energy back into this, this lineage before you go into retreat. He's going into retreat for three years. 
mm. in 2025. <clears throat> but he said, well, already so many things, you know, I have to do before I go into retreat. I, I don't know if I can do that. And also he says, you know, the main monastery is quite busy already with all these things that have been scheduled. I was like, please, please, you have to do it. You know, one week is all it takes, you know. Then he looked at me and he said, how about I give this empowerment at your center? I was like, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, oh, yes, please, of course. <laughs> uh, but he also didn't want to say exactly when, so we were all kept you know, on our toes. Like, he didn't say whether, at first we thought maybe Thursday night before everything started, <coughs> Friday night, and in the end he said, I'll give it when I give the Bodhisattva vow on Saturday. So many people who signed up for the Bodhisattva vow on Zoom were surprised by the announcement at that point, saying, and after the Bodhisattva vow, he will, His Holiness will continue into giving this uh, profound path of accomplishing the Guru. Mm. So anyway, <clears throat> doing as I was saying, so during all this time, I was uh, very busy uh, working on translating uh, the beginning sadness needed for this cycle. So now, more or less, I finished translating the outer sadhana with the mundo, the inner sadhana, the secret sadhana, and the reality level sadhana. So all four sadhanas are basically done. I just have to clean, clean up the translations and then um, they will be ready. Mm. So that's <laughs> report on current events. <laughs> and uh, you all have been continuing, right, with the um, Pomodrupa's Lamrim text, yeah? Yep. Where are you guys now? <clears throat> We just finished the realms. We were on chapter six going for refuge. That's uh -huh. where we would start if we were starting okay. today. Uh, uh, let me look for my text. Uh, I believe it's here. But where did it go? Hmm. What's the name of the book? Engaging my stages in the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, it's a PDF file. I've got the book. Yeah, there's also the book. Uh, I think many of you also <laughs> bought the book. Yeah. A two volume book. I have two books. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lai, we did have a question about the rounds. Sure. So whenever so, you're ready to. We can start there and take us to the page. Yeah. It's for me? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> what page? Page that holds the question. Yeah. See, do you remember? Sure, sure, sure. We no, about... it's a broader question. That it's general with regard to how we are to understand the hell rooms. Oh right. <laughs> Can you ask it, Steve? Do you remember how to word it? Okay. Yes. How do we understand the hell realms? <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, tell me what's the problem? <laughs> the hell well, we, yeah. we assume there's some question as to how literally to take this, and even if it's literal or not, how we would understand that within yeah uh, the cycle of birth and death so let's turn that around and ask you know what what does this tell us you know that we need to 
figure out how to understand what is said here. What does that tell? Yeah, what, what does that tell us about us? <laughs> well, we had what, so what we is, came to a conclusion that it probably was a motivating thing, but we didn't know. Uh, is but this before, provided yeah, to motivate the student? Even, before even like, is this true? Is this not true? Like, what does it tell us? What can it tell us that, that we are struggling with? Like, how am I supposed to understand the hell realms? You know, like needing further interpretation and not just face value. I'm not saying that you should accept it on face value. I, I'm, I'm saying, what can it tell us about us when, you know, when especially with the hell realms who say, ah, I, I need further unpacking. <laughs> Well, well, for one, I was brought up in the Baptist church and hell was a real place and it was very scary. Mm -hmm. And that's why you believe in Jesus because he will save you from the hell realms. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, what, that's the background I'm coming from. Right, right. And so we want to do what now with this? We don't want to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Well, it, I kind of think in terms that the hell realms exist in life mm -hmm. here and now, mm -hmm. not so much as other place, other time. Yes. And why? Why? Why do we say here and now and not there and later? Because there's all kinds of hell through here. But does it have to cancel there and later? Like there's hell realm in my neighborhood. Then there's hell realm, you know halfway across the world. Yes, but we experience them as at, while we are incarnated. And I think that was part of the question. Sorry? Is this an after death experience or is this a during life experience? Is it either or? We don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And why do we want it to be either or? I think it's fair I think, to say that when we ask this question, including myself, I want it to be metaphorical, mm -hmm. you know? I remember reading a survey that was done, uh, I think the Pew survey on religion, you know, this very, I don't know if you all know about it, a geek in religious studies, like academics, <laughs> you know, we, we know about this, you know, there's the Pew survey on religion, Pew trust, you know? And there's a high percentage of Americans who have no problems believing in heaven, but don't like to believe in hell. And it's like, so it's like logically kind of inconsistent. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be logically inconsistent. I'm, I'm just pointing out and I think wanting to get deeper to like, what, what are we uncomfortable with? when we talk about hell realms. And I think when we understand that, then more important than whether it's here and now, there and later, metaphorical, literal, there's something more important that we have to understand about hell realms. We suspected that. That's why we're happy you're here. Yeah. So what? What's that? You know. What? What is this? What? What is this more important thing that we should understand? And then also to help us navigate through, right? I mean, it's like saying, I was scared the bejesus, no pun intended, or pun intended, by this hell talk. So now I don't want to believe in it. Well, yes, it it makes sense on an emotional level, you know. So what, what's going on, you know? I think it's a state of mind. And what is not? <laughs> so it's more the fact that the hell, realm, the hell realm is inside of you and because everything can be going right all in the world, but you've got, you're in hell realm in your head 
and that that's impermanent. I mean, knowing that it's impermanent and that you'll sure. eventually go into something, another realm. Yes. That's kind of my understanding. But what is this discomfort with the hell realm? It's almost like you're like, I will accept the other five, but not that one. That one is metaphorical, the <laughs> other five potentially <laughs> real. The suffering aspect? Yeah, so what are we uncomfortable with? The suffering. Probably the suffering. Mm -hmm. And so will the suffering go away because we think it's metaphorical? No. Nope. Nope. Yeah. yeah, so we should not fall back on the metaphorical so quickly. Mm, neither am I advocating, you know, this kind of fundamentalist. Uh, <laughs> it's real, right? But it's not so easily or so so automatic or so simply uh, real or not real. Mm. Uh, how real is it? As real as you know uh, what I'm experiencing now. How unreal is it? As unreal as what? What I'm experiencing now. First, we have to get that. Can we really get that? You know, do we get that first before we uh, metaphorize the hell realms? If you have metaphorize, uh, I don't know if that's a word, but if you metaphorize the hell realm, then you have to metaphorize the animal realm. You have to metaphorize the hungry ghost realm. You have to metaphorize the human realm. <laughs> And the demigods and the gods. Then it has to equally apply to all six realms. The six realms were identified and taught, not so that you can say, oh, this is metaphorical, this is not metaphorical. <laughs> the Buddha did say all six realms are metaphorical. And that six realms includes human realm. Mm -hmm. So now more importantly, think about this. What does it mean that the human realm is also metaphorized? So how real is this? Huh? How real is that? Right now, very real probably unskillfully so, very real. And if right now this is very real, then the way these hell realms are described will become also very real when you are there. If this here can be experienced differently, less solidly, less uh, stuck, less rigid, then when the hell realm turns up, it can also be experienced similarly. You see, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. So the important part is to train your perception and experience of this Yeah, you cannot, we cannot walk around like, this is real. And the other five describe, oh, they're all metaphors. <laughs> then, then it's basically, uh, you know, secular material, materialist views of reality. Hmm? I mean, which is a valid, you know, uh, ideology or philosophy or view to hold, but don't call that Buddhism. <laughs> I think that's when we're not, you know, not not really doing our homework. If we want to call that Buddha Dharma, I think that's when I disagree. So is this life a metaphor? <laughs> 
Yes. And no. It's not about whether it is or it is not. It's about how are you perceiving? How are you experiencing? That's the most crucial point. Yeah, so in Mahamudra teachings, it says, you know, like the general teachings focus a lot about the details of the external world. But the essence teachings focus on your experience of the external world. So we say the, the general way is to analyze uh, the nature of phenomena. The essence way is to analyze uh, the nature of that which is experiencing uh, the world. So more importantly, uh, is that which is experiencing. So it's not even about is this a pure land or not? Abstract. Can you experience this as a pure land or not? Directly related to yeah. our training. Is samsara and nirvana one or two? Well, there are all kinds of philosophical uh, positions on that. But it's not enough to mouth out samsara and nirvana is one. Really? Right now? True? Really? <laughs> it's just rumors. You know? Our task is not to believe or to reject. So in Mahamudra it says, you know, neither accepting nor rejecting. It means this, you know. The Dharma is not, you, you don't, it's not the right relationship with Dharma if you feel like, I need to accept this, I need to reject this. But rather, is this real for me right now? Like this teaching, maybe not the word real, because we're using the word real in this other context. It's like, this teaching, you know, am I able to actualize this or not? That samsara and nirvana is inseparable, has one nature. So heaven, hell, you know, all are within one thought. Yes, very nice, you know, that those words. But have we experienced that or not? Maybe, sometimes, you know, fleeting, right? I think, yes, you know, in fleeting moments, we, we, we catch a glimpse of that, you know, and then our confused habit patterns take over. Then we go back to business as usual, bad business as usual. Yeah. And so this coming back right to the question of the hell realms. So then to address, you know, the very real question of like, and those of us who have been scarred by you know, these teachings about the hells, right? Um, like Halloween, what is it in the South? These haunted houses? No, ha not haunted houses, like hell houses. No, they don't call it that. No. Now, some Baptist churches here no. <laughs> have, you know, during Halloween, um, they they have these I, I forgot what they call it we have it in in North Carolina um I always like to tell people like uh you can look this up uh, on Google you know this this place in Singapore called they have one in Singapore they have one in Hong Kong but I think they've over the years as as culture change you know I think they've also changed it's like a theme park but really you know in, by modern standards, like a badly done theme park. But it's a Chinese mythology theme park called Hopa Villa. H-A-W, first word, second word, P-A-R, Hopa Villa. It's the old mansion of these two brothers. 
And the, these are names, part of their names, Ho and Pa, which actually means tiger and panther in Chinese. Anyway, it's named after them. They gave their estate to this charitable uh, foundation that then created, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do anything, okay? Yeah. Confetti. Confetti. Yeah, confetti just fell from the sky. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> anyway, um, part of the theme park was the tunnels of the Hell Realms. And, and you walk through them in these dark tunnels, and, and you enter the ten hells in Chinese mythology. And in gory details, uh, they illustrate with tiny, like uh, mud statues. Uh, this is what happens to liars. They pull your tongue out and these demons are stabbing your tongue with like spikes. And this is what happened to people who steal, you know, like their hands are like, being deep fried in like cauldrons of oil. <laughs> and every time we went to Singapore as kids, like my brother is six years older than me and he enjoyed like taking me through the tunnels and... and, and... <laughs> <laughs> and so I have the equivalent of, you know, this kind of like, ah! And like, no, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And, you know, it's like, no, you have to go. It's like a, a every year reminder, like, you know, behave yourself or you, you know, end up in one of these hells. Uh, now, yeah, whether it's God, whether it's even more abstract, right here, there's no one God in charge, but there's this notion that you will pay for your actions, you know. Again, I think hell realms are real. I, if you ask me, mm -hmm. as real as this, yeah. And hell realms are not real, as not real as this. But right now, because I'm experiencing all of this as very real, then I said, you know, for myself, the hell realms are going to be very real. Oh, jeez. That? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> one of you is doing it, or I have no idea. Are you using an iPhone as your camera? No, this is my regular computer. It happens in DDIS sometimes too. It's uh -huh. it's a feature that I think you have to turn it off. But it's when you make certain hand gestures, like I think if you wave your hands. Like that or something. What was it <laughs> that makes the confetti Thumbs come up. down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your computer uh, tormenting us. Is that <laughs> Do you remember? Real or unreal? Real showed us. You oh, I know. I know. It was on the... Uh, they have been turning up at just the right time, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Oh. So that's the magic, I think. But it's nothing to do with me. Uh, Maybe it's Karen? No, no. I don't know. There's a trickster somewhere that is like. No. Anyway, right? So, so I think for many of us, right? First of all, we have to understand like these teachings. You know, even though they might exist in other cultures, other traditions, in some form or another, like in the Buddhist context, it's very different. It's not about judgment. It's not about God. It's not about like scaring you into behaving. It's not, it's describing all forms of suffering that exist. In Shantideva's Bodhicayavatara, you know, he says, where did all these demons of the hells come from? Where did all these jailers come from? They come from our actions. He doesn't quite say, you know, that these are metaphors, you know, they have, they have words like this. 
you know, if it is metaphorical the way you and I think of it, you know, Shanti Deva could easily just say that, you know, like why beat around the bush? Because this is not how you're supposed to relate to these teachings. Hmm? It's understandable, given our background, that we immediately relate to it as true or not true, real or not real, literal or not. Because we think those, those are the right questions. But the Buddha gave them not to raise that question, but rather to help us understand that which is experiencing this, that which creates happiness and suffering. Do you understand that? That that which creates suffering can create so much suffering, so much as it is described here in the hell realms. Can you see that you can create so much suffering and cannot get out of it. And likewise, can you see that this can also create so much happiness? But whether happiness or suffering, as long as they are still part of the six realms of confused existence, so now we get to the more important points. Whether extreme happiness or extreme suffering, whether the things that you like or the things that you don't like, yeah, as long as they are still under the grip of this creature, right, the wheel of becoming, as long as they're still under the grasp of ignorant confusion, even the happiest realms of existence, the God realms, they are unreliable. They're not unreliable because someone is out to deceive you. There's no Satan figure hiding behind causing mischief. They're unreliable because by nature, things are impermanent, subject to change. And if our hopes for happiness and our self-identity is going to be built based on conditions that are changing, shifting, moving, unstable. All those are neutral, right? Neutral factual terms. Unreliable is an emotional term, right? Shifting, changing, impermanent, even unstable. All those are just factual description of everything around us. And out of that, we have the emotional uh, word of unreliable. <laughs> so can we see the unreliable nature of phenomena? And phenomena, by phenomena, we mean, you know, compounded things. If they're compounded, you know, they're unreliable. If they're unreliable, why are they unreliable? Because they're shifting, changing, moving in flux. And as for that, it's neither good nor bad, right? But we have preferences. So then good and bad comes in. Can we see that? And if we can see that, can we start working on that? So that is most important. We have to work on that. We have to work on that. Yes. That helps me a lot. Good. <laughs> yes.
yeah so anyway uh, i'm gonna get going now uh we maybe meet next week i'm not sure uh, but when i can i will join thank you thank you thank you, thank you dr long Always most appreciate At the start, you know, all your New Year resolutions can be new again. <laughs> As I was telling people this morning at the temple, and this will last for a while, but uh, don't worry, because in April, there's another New Year. <laughs> celebrated in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Then you can again have New Year resolutions and a new start, and you know, so there are endless possibilities now of uh, celebrating New Year's. <laughs> well, there's another dragon. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no dragon! It's a different system. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so yeah, okay, Tata, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You don't get any of the confetti. <clears throat> That's a bad. Oh,